I deal with some pretty serious thalassophobia. The fear of deep, expansive bodies of water. And tend to avoid most games that involve diving underwater. So I'm surprised to be saying, Abzu is one of the most gratifying video games I've ever played. Having heard it was a wordless exploration of the ocean, I honestly wasn't expecting much. Because when it comes to swimming sections in three-dimensional games, I often just leave feeling frustrated. They're awkward to control, they feel sluggish at best, they add gratuitous stress, and their gameplay is often completely different from the game you've been playing up until that point. So when I was flipping and spinning around the seas of Abzu, I was a little shocked by how graceful it all felt. The cadence of every stroke just felt natural. But this excellence in game design really highlighted something for me. Most video game swimming sucks, but it doesn't have to. Over on Twitch, I recently started playing through the Kingdom Hearts series, which was one of my favorite franchises growing up. It was such a blast to experience all those nostalgic locales again as an adult. But one thing they don't tell you about revisiting your nostalgia, you've got much better critical thinking skills now. So I saw a lot of cracks in my rose-tinted glasses, among many other awkward quirks. The entire world of Atlantica was a slog to wade through. The swimming, even in the HD remake, is gratingly stiff, which makes underwater combat a chore at best. You're no longer able to dodge roll or block, which are gameplay staples by this point in Sora's journey. Holding circle or square to raise or lower Sora is so deliciously awkward that I wanted to leave this area as soon as I got there. And it's not until about halfway through this section that you gain the ability to speed up your swimming by tapping circle or square. You know, the same buttons you use to paddle up or down. And don't get me started on the Ursula boss fight. That's a whole different level of finny frustration. The swimming here is a prime example of early 2000s game devs having no idea what to do when it came to designing a control scheme for swimming underwater. That might be why Square Enix decided to scrap Atlantica and Kingdom Hearts 2. Mostly. Oh, we don't talk about Kingdom Hearts 2 Atlantica. To have a lot of 3D Super Mario games also run into the problem of swimming feeling unnatural. Whether it's Super Mario 64, or Galaxy, or Sunshine, when Mario dips below the surface, the plumber's intuitive controls start to flounder. The main problem is that we're being asked to explore 3D space with what's inherently a 2D control scheme. Introducing a third axis of movement creates an avalanche of compounding problems. And getting everything to be in balance to find that elusive game feel is really tricky. That sensation in gaming where control inputs match perfectly with our expected outputs of our character. Despite Mario water levels having some of the most calming music in the series, you won't be hearing any of it because of how much you'll be shouting at your television. Nintendo cranked the resistance of the water up to the point that you feel like you're swimming through molasses, while also trying to dodge projectiles. It's not fun and feels awful. And some games have the complete opposite problem. Ty the Tasmanian Tiger, for example, has underwater controls that are actually too responsive and a camera that can never seem to keep up. So when you try to overcorrect your trajectory to make up for it, well, there's a mine waiting to ruin your day. Many modern games actually get around all of these issues by remaining in a first-person perspective, which eliminates the difficulty of camera and control. In these games, instead of trying to wrangle both movements and camera perspectives, you can aim your reticle in the direction you want to swim and push forward. Easy. But the swimming feels stiff at best, without any feeling of fluid motion. And don't forget your obligatory breath counter. Since letting the player swim in a 3D space can be such a hard thing to get right, 
For decades, developers chose to make most video game protagonists hydrophobic. Everyone from cowboys to crime fighters couldn't even dip a toe in the shallow end of the pool without immediately dying. Of course, this was easier than programming what you would need for exploring the water. Developers would also have needed to animate the movements of the player character swimming, which would involve even more labor. This might explain why so many games, especially those made in the early days of 3D gaming, were so quick to kill off protagonists who were foolish enough to step into a body of water. More often than not, being forced into the water in a video game doesn't add much to the overall gameplay. It just makes the entire experience sink into tedium. That slowdown during swimming doesn't have to be tedious though. In fact, it can be the most intense part of the game, depending on how the creators incorporate it. In horror games, forcing a character to swim away from a pursuer is a great way to add a natural source of tension. If your mobility is suddenly taken from you, you're much more likely to feel the pressure. And having a horror game find ways to really make you fear for your life without resorting to jump scares is a sign of successful game design. But that's a different video. The reason these sections make us sweat is because of a deep-seated psychological response linked to perceived control. The feeling that we have the power to exert our influence over something. According to a study done by the University of Texas about players' emotional response to video game controls, our brains tie perceived control with a sensation of safety, both in gaming and in our day-to-day -day lives. So when we feel like we are no longer in control of our movements, whether or not we actually are, our brains start panicking. And what better excuse to take some amount of control away from the player than to drop them in a water level. But putting the player in a wetter situation than the rest of the game can also run the risk of feeling disjointed. Sonic Mania definitely runs into this problem, despite it being a great game in many other ways. For a celebration of what made the early days of Sonic so thrilling, the devs did a great job giving every level a frantic energy. Sonic races through locales new and old, with lots of options as to how the player approaches each level. But once you hit the Hydrocity Zone, Hydrocity Zone? everything slows to a duck paddle. The chaotic speed is exchanged for much slower movement. The momentum that these games often get right is thrown out in favor of awkwardly slow jumping. Not only that, but the Sonic games introduced one of the most anxiety-inducing sounds in all of gaming history to accompany their water levels. Sonic's water levels tend to be the worst received in their respective titles because of how much they oppose the design ethos of the rest of the series. Design ethos being the idea or theme that links all the game's mechanics and principles together to make them feel cohesive. And for the Sonic series, most of the time anyway, that's challenging platforming that rewards forward momentum. Throwing the hedgehog underwater usually results in that not coming to fruition. As frustrating as the level may be though, the underwater controls are still solid. The controller layout and the axes that Sonic are operating on are both two-dimensional, which may be why swimming in most 2D titles is much less aggravating than in their 3D counterparts. For example, while Echo the Dolphin is a pretty difficult and obtuse game, the swimming mechanics here are sublime. In much the same way that Abzu's control feel responsive while retaining the feel of swimming, Echo's underwater movement feels very similar within a 2D space. But pretty much everything else about Echo the Dolphin? Questionable. Um, can you guys hear me? All right. After watching Matt Nava's GDC talk about creating the art for Abzu, it's pretty clear that there's one thing Giant Squid do better than most other studios. Thinking outside the box, over the course of Abzu's three-year development, they went against the current in almost every way. Instead of creating individual fish with skeletal rigs, which is the industry standard for character animation, they used static mesh instancing to create and animate endless individual fish through the use of algorithms. This way you get the sensation of tens of thousands of fish on screen at one time, when otherwise you may have been limited to 30 or 50. 
And five years after release, this game still swims circles around most other games that try to get these mechanics right. So when it came time to design the player's underwater movement, of course they found a way to innovate there as well. Knowing that underwater traversal is classically one of the most hated tropes in game design, the head gameplay engineer, Max Kaufman, explains in a blog post that their goal was to simulate swimming without feeling swimmy. As counterintuitive as that sounds, it shows these devs knew exactly what the pitfalls of making an underwater game in 3D would end up being. Their first hurdle in the design process was the camera. Instead of making a camera that the player has to constantly adjust to see where they're going, the designers created a predictive camera. Whenever you move in the game, the camera aligns itself by predicting where you will end up, allowing you to see what will be in front of you once the movement animation is finished. So even though this makes the controls of the game feel slightly floaty, it makes the camera much less of an issue for the player. The only times I moved the camera myself in the game were to get cinematic shots of my character riding on the back of bigger fish. The controls themselves were an entire web of systems that giant squid had to untangle from scratch. To dodge frustrating input reversing while your character is upside down, they employ invisible corrective forces to gently nudge you to swim right side up after a twist in the water. When performing a loop, input reversing is completely turned off in the middle of the loop animation to avoid control confusion in the brief moments that the player is upside down. This means even when your character looks like they're doing advanced maneuvers, really, all you're doing is holding the analog stick in one direction. The game also encourages momentum over everything, in direct opposition to most underwater movement mechanics that we see. When you begin swimming in any direction, your velocity starts out fairly slow. But once you start using your flippers to your advantage, you'll be at top speed in no time, allowing you to effortlessly move through the large underwater landscapes that the game lets you explore. These factors all come together to make Abzu feel like second nature rather than a chore. Once you get used to the physics that are at play, you feel at home pulling off tricks using the environment to your advantage. And when control schemes melt away, letting you feel like you've been fully submerged in a foreign world, that's when you know a game's design is genius. Hey there, thank you for watching the video and I hope you enjoyed it. What do you think are the worst water levels in video games? Let me know down in the comments below. Also, I'm putting out more video game video essay content like this on the first Saturday of every month. So if that sounds like something you're down for, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, like the video, and also maybe come hang out over on Twitch. Links to everything are down in the description. See you next time.